appreciate it every day. And we believe education is a shared responsibility of the student, home, school, and community. Okay, 1E. We have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved by Daniel Bailey. Second. Second by Ben Wynn. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 2A. Was the day at the Capitol report by the superintendent? So this is just a reminder, March 22nd. Um, I sent you guys the link. And I can reshare it again um, on Friday is the day at the Capitol. I've never been. A bunch of area superintendents are going. I believe our entire group is going with business managers. And it's just an opportunity for us to do some advocacy with legislators. WASB sets up an entire schedule for the day. So they prep you some in the morning and then send you off to have some meetings in the afternoon. Some of the things that um, they, they sent out some tools for us around the budget priorities that we're asking for. There's been a really concerted effort this year for districts to be aligned in what we're asking for so that they can see, um, even though schools have different needs, we've got some shared priorities. And so we're hoping that that is an impact and then that, um, that influences the budget. So the increase an increase in spendable resources, um, significant increase in special ed aid, increase in student staff mental health funding with flexibility so that there's not all these criteria around how we can spend that mental health money and that increases in the low revenue ceiling. So those are sort of some of the main topics um, that we're trying to be aligned on um, as districts in the state. And then just talking about how, because the big dialogue has been around, we got all this ESSER funding. So then they're also helping us with some language around sharing that that's one-time funding that it wasn't meant to maintain. It's like, um, if your roof falls in and you get insurance money and then you use, your, use the insurance money to pay your mortgage, that's kind of what they asked us to do with ESSER in some ways, to take money that was meant to support COVID and use it to run mm -hmm. districts. So I'm excited about it. Like I said, I've never never gone. Everybody here is invited. Um, and I can send that out, that link out again if anybody's interested in heading up to the Capitol on March 22nd. Can you um I, I've clicked through on the toolkit, but I can't find that um, new cheat sheet on the advocacy points they're focusing so on. So this one I just got to say, so for that. Oh, know. okay. Because yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. I meant to, but I could still like send a letter. And do you guys get these emails from WASB? Yes. Because yes. okay. I don't want to be annoying and send them. I'm never sure if I should probably auto forward them along. <laughs> but I'll send that one for sure. Thank you. Um, is anybody on the board going? Besides myself, I'm gonna try to, but I'm not sure if I can. All right, I just want to check. Okay, three, uh, number three, we're going to approve this consent agenda. So moved. Moved by Andy Franklin, second, second by Carla Kennedy Cross. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Four A. New business needs a proposal for fourth grade. So this was brought to the cow meeting. Um, and so it's attached again. So we're just looking for an approval for it. So it's just giving the fourth graders that opportunity to experience the different um, tracks, I guess we'd say, before they have to make a choice in fifth grade. So you guys have another copy of the proposal, but we're just looking for an official approval for that so that the team can start planning for scheduling for next year. They have a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Carla Pennington Cross. Second. Second by Daniel Bailey. Audience, do you have anything you want to add to this? Open for discussion for the board. I just have a question about maybe you guys don't know yet um, how you're thinking about communicating this out to families. My assumption would be I know that. Anna sent out the email to families last year just around like any changes in classes and registering, and then it'll just be a part of that packet. Okay. I mean, typically that goes out to families. Okay. It's like part of the general register. Okay. It would be nice if there were like a little burst right now, it, sure. it, assuming we approve it. Yeah, I can yeah, ask for I mean, the part of the newsletter. Right. Any yeah. other discussion? Actually, we've heard. Right. That's right. It's <laughs> the third grade. Like, hold on, what if you had a hard right. so the hard Dr. Dr. Smith, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion or questions? Uh, suggestion, even if it's Dr. Smith, have Dr. Smith and the uh, principal 
um, young mm -hmm. work together. So the language is for the third graders, but also that she, it's her kids that are coming in. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna go for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are at 4B, owner's rec recommendation. Go ahead, Lindsay. So in our last meeting, we talked about how we interviewed for our owner's rep and we talked about what their role is in advocating and supporting the district as we're doing our, our facility study. Uh, the team had a unanimous vote for Kaden Consulting. Uh, they just felt that it was, we all felt that it was a great fit for the vision of the district. Um, they really had a great communication style and um, just felt like it would be a really great support communicating with the board, with the community, with our staff as well. Uh, it comes with a lot of experience mm -hmm. and uh, with a lot of other firms, uh, architecture firms as well as construction manager firms. So we are asking for a formal approval from the board to move forward with uh, team consulting. I'd also note that uh, uh, the three proposals were linked in board docs. So we have a motion. We have a motion to approve Cadence Consulting. So moved. Moved by Daniel Bailey. Second. Second by Carla Pennington Cross. Audience. I just, Open. Hold. Well, I, I, hold. I have, hold. Yeah. Audience. No. Open to the board. Um, so I had a question about uh, just one aspect of this, which is it appears, and I'm reading the board now, is there, a, what is the next step in hiring that proposals were uh, out for that we're going to be doing for the cow home? Construction manager. Okay. So, but right now we have a facility study and we have you know, an owner's rep, but I guess my point, and, we, and we're working with Ian you know, Plunkett research and um i mean why do we need construction manager so they're going to provide the cost so i'm going to be able to they're looking at our buildings looking at uh like the uh, like the entire uh, district all the buildings and the capacity that's there and they're also looking at um uh just looking at the uh, educational adequacy and then the owner's rep is representing the district and the construction manager is the cost so in the, the rfp that went out to construction managers it's just solely for the cost of phase one for that facility study. It's nothing beyond that. It's just, these are the different things that PRA is saying is what that needs to be done in our long range planning, and they're providing the physical cost. But it, and, and, and I realize that you know, it, it's not, it's not really what we're trying to prove here, but I'm just trying to understand how, you know, process and things. And so we have a, a study. Mm -hmm. We have Plunky Race reviewing the study. We have uh, a construction, an owner's rep, okay, to kind of help us with what they're doing, but I don't understand why we need a construction manager to we actually have some idea of what we might do if we do So, so uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think, um, Andy, what the part is, is that if when this recommendation comes back and they, like, whatever they say, we're going to say where, where, how much does this even cost, even if it's a recommendation or what it is. And we won't have those numbers. So that is kind of what they do. They they work with them to figure out what's the best way to do things and then give us a cost on it. Now we don't have to do anything. We could look at it and say we're not doing anything. But if we don't have the cost to it, no matter what the plan is, we will never know what where to move forward. And I appreciate that. I guess I Hold on. No, go ahead. Well, I just want to move us to stay on topic, which is that we're talking about an owner's rep. It sounds like the construction manager comes next. Mm -hmm. So we have time to ask questions about that between now and then and when it comes to us. Well, so I, I just want to make sure that. that he knows that it's all connected and, and it might be. You could disagree with me. I'm just, that's, I'm just saying. I'm just saying we're answering his question because I want him to get the full picture. So, you know, step by step. That's point. it. Uh, and then, so we're, we're hiring these people to evaluate the recommendation by the architecture firm. The, the architect isn't making a recommendation. They're just giving us the data. And they're saying, this is the, the work that needs to be done on your building. And the construction manager is doing the second piece of it, which is the cost. Because I need those costs to be able to say, financially, this is what we can do over the next 
five years, 10 years. So both of those pieces are really important because the architect is giving us all the information of what, based off the facility study that we had done with um, performing services, and then update, like taking that, updating it, seeing if there's any changes, and then these are the things that need to be replaced. These are the things that you need to look at that need to be up to code. These are all the different things that that you should be looking at when you're making your updates in your long range facility planning. But I can't do anything with that facility study without knowing the cost because is it something that's going to cost four million dollars, or is it going to be something that's going to cost fifteen million dollars? So this company is going to evaluate the costs, yeah. which is the one. No, the no, owner. The owner. It's a. It's a. She was giving you a whole holistic view. Right now, the owner's rep is going to do what's or help us with the facts with in our best interest as a district. So they're going to work. She was also giving uh, the other part of that is the next step is the um, construction manager. So it's not. We're only talking about the owner's rep right now. But I think we were just trying to give what next steps so everybody knows what's going on. And, and when you get to the, the next part, you, you say, wait a minute, I thought we did this, but we have a full understanding of the whole process. So technically we're doing, I mean, it, this isn't. Yes, we're just doing. We're, we're doing step three before step two. We're going to do step four before step three is what it sounds like. Oh. Well, I, we're doing okay, steps. Step we did two. step one. Step two is to make sure that the the district's interest is being met with the owner's rep. Now the next thing we we do if this goes through, we need to hire somebody to tell us how much this is going to cost as they give recommendations. So the owner's rep will evaluate what the architecture firm finds. Okay. Yeah, they'll look at everything from the architect firm and the construction firm. So that's why we're considering hiring them now yep. because they do need to look at the yes. architecture firm. Because they'll look at all the different models and think about things that you wouldn't have the, the, the knowledge to. Okay, and do we know, like, so much just like with the architecture firm, it's there right now, we've only hired them to do an evaluation. Mm -hmm. Nothing I mean, past phase one. So with them, it's, it looks like it's a hourly rate. Mm -hmm. um, it, like, are we holding them? Like right now, you're at you're at max this many hours. Yeah, but so right, like we had an uh, initial conversation of what would that look like, and it would just be like bi-weekly check-ins, and then it could have and flow over the next few months as we prepare to bring presentation. To but the we're not. We're not. This is not approving. Like, hey, we're giving you a hundred hours. No, so, no. Okay. It's, it's we can literally say, well, no, we're not doing anything now, so we don't need your services anymore. We're not. We're not held to. Yeah, that's the they all know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All that, Carla. So, Andy, I think. I, I mean, I hear you worrying about whether the owners' rep is sort of a superfluous role. Right? I'm fine, but look, I want to just express complete, you know, faith in the selection of the owners' rep, and I think that the owners' rep is a good idea. It's yeah. a great start. I mean, that's really what the issue is. I was looking at the big picture, and the question came up from the information that we have. To me, if we're getting, and, and so that's where that question about the process came up, because, you know, I don't know what uh, Plunger Research is going to make recommendations on, so I don't know how we, I don't know how we solicit or even respond to proposals uh, until we know what they're going to recommend. Yeah, so what I was going to say is I think if we're talking about the order of things, hypothetically, the owner's rep could have come first, yeah. right? And then that's our, I think of the owner's rep as our guardian angel. That's really supposed to be their role because we're all fairly incompetent on large scale construction and renovation and building. And, you know, all that stuff, we, we, we just don't know here. So the owner's rep is typically viewed as sort of the guardian angel and talk talk voice who knows how the industry works and interfaces with them. So they're not actually doing this substantive work for us, but they're like the guiding hand. My understanding is that it's a pretty critical role. So, you know, you got the, just like they're saying, the architect for design and evaluation, the construction manager for costing, and then the owner's rep for, Hand holding is like the classic trilogy 
for starting any project. Okay, yeah. Do you have an estimated like budget? What do you sort of earmarking for the work with the owners rep or yeah, so I with when we started the conversation in the fall, I think you're not gonna rain day fund just to check on them mm -hmm. and just to prepare for that. Yeah. Um, but again, did the proposals are for anything pre uh, this is for anything leading up to phase two. So right. this is this this could be for from now until January or February that cost is for. It's not like it ends May when we're bringing our information to the board. Yeah, actually, what I liked about their proposal was the sort of the pre-referendum planning management. I didn't see that in any of the others. The others seemed like very limited in scope and possibly more expensive. I was just trying to understand the potential cost to the district when you have an hourly like sort of just. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's one of the things where I could pretend like we, as a team, we could be like, okay, we only need to have a half hour check in every other week just to get a status update. Right. But then as we get closer to May when the study is being done, maybe we're meeting a few more times during the week. But that would be where you know, Allison and I would look at how often are we meeting, what's necessary, and still keeping an eye. But that's also one of the things that owner's rep does is she's, they're looking at the total cost of everything in this phase one, including their cost as mm -hmm. well. So okay. how much are we spending with an architect? How much are we spending with a construction manager? How much are we spending with that? So okay. yeah, the entire time throughout the process, I know all of our costs. Okay. Do you, do you have like a ballpark estimate? <laughs> That's, how many hours? That's what we're all wondering. Like what's the yeah. ballpark of this? By, by May or like four, four uh, months. Or for before, phase, before, for phase, phase one. one. So right. Um, for the owner's rep, what we'd like to do is just a half hour check in each uh, every other week. And oh, for now until the month of April. Like, yeah, so, for example, I'm having an extra meeting. Um, like, I would have an extra meeting before the construction manager would be. So, we cost be able to get a little bit more information. Yeah. But okay. there, it's kind of a lull until we get more information from the So, CRA so they're, they're betting on the fact that something, well, else something might happen. Mm -hmm. And that's the risk okay. that all of them take. Yep. Yep. Okay, that makes me feel better. Yep. Okay. <laughs> all right. Because we can, well, we can always just mm -hmm. say no and then all the expenses stop. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Anyone else? So um, we have a motion to call in favor to cadence consulting. cadence uh, to um, use cadence, cadence consulting as our owner's rep. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're going to do 5A budget update. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not asking for any approvals on this. This is just an, an, another step in, in the sharing information and an update, and then we'll be written um, some formal approvals. So uh, in the executive summary, I, I outlined, um, again, the, the salary scale that we're we're looking at updating um, based off of some feedback from our last meeting that Ms. Bailey had said. Um, in the new one, I made an incremental change that standard between bachelor scale of some $750 for each year until year 10. And then at year 10, it changes to a thousand. And then it's a 1500 increment for master's starting at year 10. So I wanted to be transparent and clear so you could see what the difference was in the increment. So the big pieces that I wanted to just highlight is that um, when we're looking at the salary scale, we want to, we're looking at the comparables for the area district, but also what we're looking at is our salaries ourselves with our district and the, the conversations we've had together as a team is that that starting salary is low. So in order to bring up that starting salary for those first five years, um, the increments for like the people with 15 to 18 years are maybe not necessarily as big of an increase in the change in the salary scale, but they're still getting an increase because of the CPI. So everybody would still get a CPI increase, but what we're doing differently is that we're adjusting people that maybe are a little bit lower on the salary, salary scale by giving them that one-time payment to bring them, or that one-time supplemental pay to bring them up to what they would be in a new state. So for example, the first year teacher, this year, let's say they're making 42000 and the new scale, we would they would be at forty eight thousand. We would give them a one time payment of six thousand to bring them up to forty eight, and then give them the five percent increase because we don't want to hire somebody new at forty eight and the teacher that was already here a year 
to be at 42. So that's that $70,000 additional amount that I was talking about. Um, and then the other piece is that when we're looking at the, the salary scale changes along with CPI increases, like that, that's a big chunk of change. And so when I talked about the total amount for the CPI increase with the scenario of 5%, you know, it, it was an increase that would bring us to about 5.8 million. The, the big key pieces I want to bring to bring it to the attention is that that is not looking at any other employee classes. So that's not looking at administrators, custodians, secretaries, paraprofessionals. So those are all pieces that I'll be bringing to the board um, comp for all of those different groups because um, we want to be equitable with all of our staff that. If we're looking at comp for teachers, are we, we want to make sure that we're doing that the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what is the next piece of information that I'm bringing to the board um, with comp. And then also, um, I just highlighted again the 5% increase with the deficit really hitting us in 24, 25. Um, next year, we could adjust for it um, just because our deficit is only about 35,000 and you can make, you can you can move stuff around to make that work. Um, but in 24, 25, we're looking at 513. And so um, that's also when our operational referendum uh, uh, is falling off. So that's why we have such a big jump from 513 to 2.5. Um, so that salary is 70% of a budget. But then there are a lot of other expenses that we have to think about. And so that was the other piece that I um, was highlighting in the summary was um, just our utilities salaries, benefits, transportation, and health insurance. So for districts around the area, we're all projecting probably about a 20% increase with utilities, which is a huge jump. Um, probably about 8% for transportation, and um, I'm hoping only a 10% for health insurance. So those are all the different pieces that I wanted to highlight with um, all of those added up. We'd be looking at just roughly 2 million in additional expenses next year. And again, that doesn't include raises for any other class or any other like future facility costs that we'd want to do. Like, for the example, this year when we had to do the roof for Good Hope. So just having those rainy day things for those things that happen that we don't necessarily like. Yeah. So, so the, the 800,000 in utilities, you're saying that's over our current utility mm -hmm. expenses. They're going to grow by 800,000. Oh, I'm sorry. No, sorry. That is the total. That is the total cost. Okay. So the projected additional expense doesn't mean 800000 over what we currently pay in utilities, but that's what you anticipate as the total cost. That's 20% more. <laughs> okay. The other piece that I just wanted to highlight is uh, some good news <laughs> um, for some cost savings that we had in 22-23, where we saved about 83750 with the new policy that passed in our um, credit reimbursement. Uh, so that was a big cost saving. And then uh, we ended up short term borrowing about a million, a million ugh, thank you, <laughs> less than we have in prior years. Um, just because when looking at what our spend was and where we were sitting, I, I felt like it was comfortable to borrow a million. Oh, God, I'm done. <laughs> and um, we ended up being uh, saving an in interest of about 23000 so those are the different things as we're looking at the upcoming budget from the governor, which again, we still don't know what kind of funding and right now it could go either way. Um, those are the different things that we want to be creative and look at where can we find savings? What are the different things that we need to look at to do? To do it? Okay, any other questions, Carla? Um, a couple more questions. I, I'm just noodling on all this. It's a lot for me to take in. I'm not a big budget person. Um, I'm looking at the salary scales, which you envision as, it seems like you envision those as lockstep. That is what? Do you envision the salaries by year as sort of lockstep salaries? Or do you? So no, it, it's really for incoming staff. So okay. once somebody's hired at that salary scale, what they would have in the future years would typically just be a CPI increase. So you don't envision like any sort of merit-based pay raises? No, not at this, at this point, point yet. <laughs> I, I think because we are really essentially building the salary mm -hmm. scale from scratch, like okay. it'd be something that we can look at each and year. Future. So for now, no differentiation based on quality or 
-hmm. evaluations or anything like that. And, and all the districts in the area, they have such different compensation battles. Like some districts use banks, some um, use the steps and lanes, some, they just, just different ones that they use. And um, I, I think as we progress over time, we can look at like factoring in those things. But one of the big pieces with the salary scale is that um, it, we want to do it with comparable to the area, not necessarily to CPI, because CPI right now, yes, is 8%, but five years ago, it was like 2%. Yeah. And so that's why districts a lot of times have supplemental pay because not everything is tied then to CPI. Can because you get that? Sorry, I was just going to say, we've had conversations about taking some of those things into account in the future, like even life, certain licensures or professional development or things like that, but we're just not, you're not there yet. No. Okay. Um, and then I, I wanted to make sure and I understood what you were saying about the, um, like the pay adjustment, the example you used for a first year, mm -hmm. right? You said there would be a one-time payment to them, but then would their base salary bump up to the lockstep? All right. So that, so a first year this year, will get the bump for next year, plus a sort of backward looking so they would get payment. the, the difference, so let's say the 6000 in the scenario that I used, and then they would get the CPI increase, and again, the scenario of 5% on 48000 And so they would okay. get essentially like a little bit bigger bump. And that's why in some districts, when they do CPI increases, it's just a bucket and you spread it across all of the different pays. But what we're doing is we're just adjusting for it in a, a one-time supplemental pay, and it's then everybody's getting the same CPI increase. Because if you spread it across, sometimes the lower ones are, are getting maybe an 8% rate, but then people that are higher salaries are getting maybe a 4 or 3% rate. And so we're, we're doing the raises in the flat across the board right now, because again, it, it's just the long-term thinking of what are we doing to retain our staff? And we're wanting to stay competitive. Because I, I feel like I'm I'm going to have to dig my head into it because they talk about the 750 difference in each year, but then the CPI is an 8% number, so that's not going to be 750 by a year. That 8% is a bigger number for higher. Oh, for, for you know what I mean? Yeah, I just, but that's why I would say, like, but that's why we're looking at the salary scale each year because I see, I see. we have to look at it. Well, how is it looking in comparables? And then what, like, how are we adjusting for CPI with our current staff? Because okay. that salary scale is with a new staff coming in. Okay, and then one um, last question. Sure. Um, the assumptions on budget impact, that's based on the assumption that the teacher numbers all stay the same, right? Mm -hmm. No new teachers, no losses. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, like, I built in and I looked at um, if we were to have any potential retirees, and but I don't take any, uh, any cuts in staffing. I plan it as is, and then if for some reason you have a shift and we don't have a, an extra staff member, like a paraprofessional, um, I still have that cushion to accommodate for any additional staffing that we might need. Um, I just have a, a comment. Um, I understand we try to do it the most equitable way, but I, I'm just going to put this out there. I hate percentages um, because no matter if you say, I'm giving everybody a 5% increase, the lower people are getting 5% off that lower. And then the higher paid people and administrators are getting a huge amount on a 5%. So I, um, a lot of times, this is one of the conversations we've had previously um, that it could be CPI, but we give a higher percentage to the lower wage workers because if somebody's making $17 an hour as a para, that 5%, and then let's take Allison, she's making this and she gets a 5%. That's a, he beats a both 5%, but that's a hell of a huge difference. And that is, so I, I just suggest that we look at, I, I don't, I don't know how you're going to do it. That's not my job. I'm just telling you what I want to see or something like that. What I would like to see is some kind of, of scale that it might be a percentage, but it can't be so high with administrators and, and higher marks. And we're forgetting the people who have a lower salaries that, yeah, they might get 5%, but that's squat compared to, and they need to live too. And we I talked think, about that with peer professionals, and that's why last year we did do hire for peer professionals. So totally what you're saying. The thing with teachers is you almost feel like, so if they've been here for 15 years, they've earned that salary, 
Do you know what I'm saying in some ways? So that's why we look at teachers as all kind of getting that same. But you're talking about but administrative too, and that's I'm looking I'm at that's the whole different. holistic. And right now we're just talking about the teachers. But I understand yeah. that, but we still are good. You said one thing that you kept saying was that we're going to try to do it. We're going to look at teachers for now, but we're going to try to be mm -hmm. equitable across mm -hmm. the board, which means the same thing. I just. And so when, when I say equitable, it doesn't necessarily mean the same. Thing. All right. That's, I, I should clarify that. Because okay. That's why I think the comps are so important. The comparables. Okay. That's all I want. What are other districts paying? And what are yeah. we paying? Maybe we need to give them a little bit higher to bring them up yeah. to where. Or we leave it the so same. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, it, it, mm -hmm. it, I want you to look at it and not just be yep. so out of luck. Um, I don't remember who had their hand at first. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, so I just want to say that it, it is difficult to pay teachers by uh, quality. Um, so I know that that is an idea that's thrown around, but uh, that that is a difficult thing to measure. Um, so just, I mean, but it could be something where it's like you attend a professional development session and you get fifty dollars, or like just something where it's like you can build on it by actions rather than perception. Um. So anyway, but the, okay. So I know I emailed this really late, but uh, I just want to explain myself. So because this could make everyone's life easier, I think. Um. So if you. Uh, like, and it doesn't have to be the exact numbers, but if you base the first 10 years and you do a 2% raise for each person for the first 10 years, and then after that, it's a 1.5% raise, it would be, uh, that'd be pretty much the same raise per year, about, you know, roughly, give or take a few hundred dollars, or I think at most it's $200. But each year you apply CPI to the starting salary. So I wish I could, well, I, anyway, you guys can see what I'm talking about, but um, basically, uh, so let's say the starting salary for uh, one year was, you know, 48,000, right? So then um, for the first 10 years, you increase that salary each time by 2%. Then after that, it's 1.5%. Well, okay, so now let's say there's a 4% CPI because we're not gonna have 8% every year, right? You apply 4% to the 48,000, you get 49,920 for a starting salary then for the next year. And then for that, uh, for that teacher, then you apply the 2% rates after that. No, it's really good feedback, I appreciate that. So it, so it might, I don't know, that might actually end up be nice because then not only do you do a CPI adjustment, again, at most years, it's gonna be one, 2%. Um, but then on that, an additional 2%, so you're actually increasing their mm -hmm. standard of living. No, that's great feedback. Thanks. So anyway, I sent you the spreadsheet, it has the equations in it, so um, can I do that? Uh, let, let's sure. see, um, let um, Allison share it with the board. Okay. Oh, okay, I sent it to her. So All you're right. you're yeah. proposing a 2% increase each year for first 10 years plus CPI, but yeah. in the opposite yeah, direction. Yeah, in the other direction, right? Yeah, I got it. Any other questions? But then 1.5% after the yeah. Danielle? This is just like more of a request for when you come back with additional information. So I'm excited to see the comps for Paris, support staff for all the, all the other areas. Um, I would like to see, I think you may have done this before when we were sort of starting the salary schedule, like where current salaries sit, like our actual salaries, because the salary scale is like what they're supposed to get, right? Mm -hmm. So like right. kind of understanding. Right, so like when new people come in, what's it going to look like for their, you know, mm -hmm. grouping their first or second year? So just kind of understanding what the current situation is. And for the paras, I would encourage you to think about, like, how we can be really competitive mm -hmm. and get quality paras who want to stay and want to be here because their job is really hard. Maybe that is salary, maybe it's benefits, maybe it's further education, stipends, things like mm -hmm. that. Like, maybe we can be creative. Uh, but I'm being in the schoolhouses right now. I'm hearing about sort of the struggle about the staff shortage that I know is universal, but it feels extra hard here for teachers. Um, and I think that I don't know if you if you want to survey them if they'd say you know not that we take less, but just that like pouring some money into that will help them maybe not financially, but socially, emotionally, <laughs> mentally. So that those are my. Okay, um, not, not we do have some part like we've worked on some partnerships with some parents for some education <laughs> and like 
credits and like did they, working did they, at all? Like all or that's, some? No, that was the Alverno thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we're definitely open to yeah, like yeah, like yeah. Mm -hmm. So and more like whatever we can do. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to five B Tech Plan Update. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just logged out because he was sleeping. <laughs> um, all right. I'll talk a little bit about um, the tech plan. So we um, this year we started kind of digging in um, to technology with um, two big goals. Um, the first one was providing a reliable infrastructure, um, processes, and equitable access to technology, um, resources, and devices for teaching, learning, and productivity across our entire community. And then our second goal was to ensure the sound um, data governance policies and procedures really around uh, privacy, safety, and security um, and confidentiality across the district as well. Um, in the board report, I talked a little bit about some of the objectives for the first goal. Um, we've been working, and I'm just going to highlight some of the action steps that we've been working on um, this school year and continue to um, work on. Um, so we've been, um, at the beginning of the school year, we did a review of all the inventory of purchased devices, looking at um, when um, they're going to need to be updated or we're going to have to get new models, um, such as Chromebooks, iPads, laptops. Um, Andy was here when we had to do with some tech updates within the classrooms. So we kind of looked at the entire inventory across the entire district. Of what do we have? And then thinking about a replacement cycle. So instead of doing big hits of $200,000 a year to replace all the boards, um, coming up with five-year replacement cycles um, so we could spend smaller amounts of money each year and constantly have updates um, throughout. So we currently are working on um, five, five to 10-year replacement cycles based on what the item is. So some of the items might be network, so it might be switches that need to be replaced. And so kind of laying out what that looks like across multiple years, the different access points, the internet, um, when we need to do updates for that, um, laptops, devices, iPads, um, student devices, teacher devices, um, interactive boards, document cameras, you know, all the way down to cables within the building. So all of these pieces, there's a lot that needs to be replaced and coming up with that long-term cycle is really important. Um, so that we're kind of spending the same amount each year, so we're not getting hit with a big $100,000 um, bill for technology. So we've been working on that. Um, some other big highlights is really kind of going through um, assessment readiness, um, looking at um, what our devices are, our Wi-Fi and all of that, and doing some work around that. Um, coming up with onboarding and offboarding for both staff and students. Um, what does that look like? So coming up with procedures and policies around that. Um, all right, some of our next steps are identifying a district-wide tech team. So we're looking at um, starting that and then developing a three-year plan. So instead of this one-year plan that we're kind of working on right now, um, having that tech team help develop a three-year plan. And then that will involve more stakeholders as well. So we'll get students involved, um, the community, and then that team. And then also that team will look at that educational technology piece as well. Um, currently, we just sent out a staff survey um, looking at um, what are some of the training needs that our staff need, and then what tech packages they're interested in within their classroom. So we have universal packages. So, if, so we, it's, we're all equitable. So some teachers in the past might have had some fancy stuff, someone may not have had it. So it, just so everyone has, you know, access to the same things. So we'll be looking at that um, survey when that comes back and kind of making some plans from that. Um, when we look at our second goal, really looking at some of those procedures as well, is really digging into um, reviewing our um, digital safety policies and acceptable use, um, coming up with some policies around that, and then we'll bring those um, to the board. And then also in, in August, we'll have to walk staff through some of that. What does it mean to you know, have double passwords and all of that? Um, because very easily, um, things can happen for students and for staff. 
And then we're also um, working on a complete full network and security audit. So we have new line coming in and um, they're doing an audit. They're supposed to be done hopefully by the end of the month, looking at all of everything that we have um, within the buildings. <coughs> and then what else do we have? Um, and just also offering some um, parent support as well um, and families. So coming up with um, a page on the website I'm just kind of devoted to how to support your child with that digi digital privacy and safety. And then coming up um, with a night that we have like the SL, SEL team or SST team, I should say. And then um, the tech team doing some work around like hosting a digital safety um, and security sessions for families, kind of helping support some of that. So those are kind of the big um, items that we're working on this school year. All right, uh, thank you, Jenica. Um, it's, it's very, this is just discussion, correct? All right, um, Danielle, I think I saw your hand first. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I was, I was very, <laughs> no, I don't have, uh, or do you want to go second after somebody else? <laughs> no, I just, I, the last thing you said got me excited thinking about the community offerings and resources. Um, not just around safety, so thinking about equity and access and just like how you can, like, I'd love to just hear more when you start doing some of that community engagement and figure out how we can help like support and mm -hmm. uh, promote that. And does the audit include like, uh, is it auditing like student usage of our devices, like time that students are on YouTube in their classrooms versus, you know, like, yeah, I know that that is sometimes a concern that we hear about, like mm -hmm. our students utilizing. So curious about that. And then the last piece is just, I like, I'd love to hear more, I'm imagining it as part of a later phase about this, like, um, uh, a measurable impact on teaching and learning. So I'd love to keep learning about how you guys are thinking about measuring the impact of technology in the classrooms, um, just because we also know how screen time, you know, screen time gets a really bad rap, probably rightfully so based on new studies. And so thinking about that interface and whether that's real, you know, like I'm just curious to learn more about that. Yeah, you guys think about that. And the tech team will really kind of work through, like there's a digital integration layers um, with different, you know, tech standards and different things like that that will kind of phase through. Um, so we can bring more of that as we go through that process yeah. together yeah. Okay. Um, as a team. So yeah. absolutely. Because okay. then we can have some of those progress methods. <clears throat> and then also going back to some of the research as well. <clears throat> and then the audit, is there any, like, is there any assessment? Are we doing any kind of assessment about, like, proper, like, proper, but, like, the way kids are utilizing technology? In uh, we can run some of that. Um, mostly we can, we can run it over here at Glen Hills with Securely. Right. Uh, right. So, okay. So we can okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you. Where are my notes? Oh, that's my comment. <laughs> um, I love that you were talking about putting together a tech team that engages community members. Love that. I would encourage you to consider leaning in on students to provide a lot of feedback. The stuff I hear from kids, they're often more aware of what they're each doing. I'm sure you know this too, Anna, right? My son will come home and, you know, like he can identify for me the kids who have breached every security measure you have, you know? I like, he's like, oh, so-and-so, all he does is play games. He's really struggling. And I say, how do you know all he does is play games? He's like, everyone in the class knows. And I say, how does he play games all day? They've got blockers. He says he's got... He's identified every unblocker that exists. So in terms of like, I would encourage you to seek out information from students as like your, your font of wisdom, um, because I, I don't even know what they're talking about anymore. Um, I'm curious who's doing the initial work now as you put together that kind of rolling replacement cycle. Is that just your, your current tech team who's putting that together? Awesome. Um, so just to Myself, um, Alice is on the team, Lindsay, a oh, library media specialist. Um, we work with. Um, mm -hmm. oh, and then um, I also love the idea of putting some caregiver support up on the web page. The most common complaints, not complaints, 
challenges that I've experienced and I hear frequently from families about is simply how to access, <laughs> not even like how to guide our children, but just how to access. So I don't know if that's already up there, just, you know, just how to find information, how to use infinite campus. There's some. That sort of like, there should be little buttons, right? But Baby steps to help yeah. families through. Like something about it is intimidating. They recently sent out a communication. I just want to say thank you because it was grades are up, and then here's a little PDF on how. Oh to yeah, that was perfect. Because it. it's like, oh right, in this mm -hmm. moment, mm -hmm. I don't have to go look for this. So that was really. I had that same reaction. reaction. It was it was really nice of them. Um, I just have one comment. Um, as much as we do technology, and I believe in, so I'm just going to put this this two cents in. As much as we we value technology, let's make and I, I think uh, either one of you two said it. Let's make sure that it's helping with test scores, making sure it helps with it. We can have the best technology in the world if it's not helping the kids. Yeah. Then it's a waste of money. Absolutely. So. I really want to, I would focus not so much on, um, I mean, opinion. I wouldn't focus so much on what's new, what's out there, what teachers want to it per se, is, and, and I would focus more on, does this technology help a child learn? Does this technology help us grow? Does this technology make us better? I'd pay a whole bunch of money for technology that I really thought was gonna help, or we can pay little or nothing for all these fancy things that are not gonna help a student. That's just an opinion of mine. Thank you. Uh, ben. I will bash your opinion up with Oh that. God. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, stop the meeting. Ben and I have agreed on something. Hold on. <laughs> well, no, I mean, well, we know that the effect size of technology is not that high. Um, however, you know, there are some areas you need, you need it. So, you know, when I taught a course where we programmed with Python, I needed computers, right? Um, so that was necessary. Um, Delta math uh, or Alex math, okay, you need a computer, right? And the reasons, uh, you know, like Alex is beneficial to students is not because it's a technology, but because it is a, it, it's, it's programmed well, right? Um, and it helps students learn math. But, you know, when we mention things about smart boards and things like that, like if I'm teaching math, I don't need a smart board. I need a projector, right? So I'm not, so anyway, my, my only point is that, um, and I know you are, but we just have to be careful where we're putting the money because again, it's, what has a huge effect size is, you know, direct instruction, right? Uh, behavior, things like that. Those all have a, a big effect size. So we just have to be careful where we're putting the money because the technology is important and you need it in certain areas for sure. But you know, you know, like again, if, if someone asked me, do you need a smart board to teach math? I would say no. But did I want Delta math? Yeah. Did I want CUDA software? Yeah. Did I want to use Desmos in my classroom? Absolutely. You know, and those are technologies, but they are less expensive than a new, you know, smart board. Um, I have I take back everything I just said. It's too much like what Ben said, and I'm scared. Any other comments? We will go to 5C, Feature Agenda Topics. Uh, I really would love to get a GT update. Uh, we're responding to the audit. What's going on with the programming this year at Berkeley and at Glenn Anyone else? Okay, 6A, visitor participation. Going once, going twice. Sweet, 7A, motion to so adjourn. Moved. <laughs> moved by Carla, seconded by, uh, who was the second? Danielle, <laughs> <laughs> any discussion? Audience, well, would you like to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Uh, all in favor? Uh, 